Andrea Copeland. This is my colleague, Stan Moore. We're from Indiana University, from the School of Informatics and Computing. So first, I will provide a context for the method that we're proposing. And then uh, Skip will illustrate how these methods might work. And I, uh, in theory, and I say in theory because we are currently in the process of developing a prototype based on a couple of case studies, which I will discuss. So a vast array of personal and community information is shared and stored on social networking sites, blogs and web pages, from text to images, music, etc. And much of this is stored uh, on sites or pages provided by commercial providers. Uh, this content documents our collective social heritage, and unfortunately it's in the hands of corporate entities which could cease to exist tomorrow. And for the most part, memory organizations have not been in the process of, have been involved in the process of collecting and preserving this foreign digital information that uh, really um, provides a context of everyday digital life uh, for individuals and communities. So through our research, we hope to address some of the barriers um, uh, between individual groups and individuals and community groups to formal and sustainable infrastructures for preservation. So if you're not, so if you're not uh, an individual who's connected to a research or government agency, then there's really little hope that you um, would know how to connect your own, uh, your community's um, heritage output to any sort of formal infrastructure. So we would like to address that problem. We think that uh, a Center for Personal Community and Heritage Informatics is the solution. So um, we would, and, and the important thing here is that this would be a bottom-up solution. Um, it would empower people, individuals, and community <laughs> groups to um, create their own collections and make their own preservation decisions. Um, we would create customizable tools and edu educational resources that we would then disseminate throughout communities through uh, the well-established network of public libraries. So the problem from another point of view uh, is that most formal digital preservation efforts are top-down and do not focus on the preservation needs of individuals or local community groups. Currently, social media platforms um, provide individuals the means to create and share content that represent their communities. However, given the commercial uh, nature of these platforms, there's no commitment to preservation or the public good. Um, <clears throat> also, the platforms tend to homogenize how things are organized and presented, and they seem to be designed uh, purposely not to provide long-term access. So in my estimation, uh, there is simply no way we can save all the content that is produced by social media. And uh, some would argue that uh, it's not all worth saving. Um, so individuals, community groups, and communities at large will have to make value judgments uh, regarding the content that is worth the effort of saving. And this is something that librarians and archives have always done. They've always evaluated uh, data <coughs> They don't keep everything. And, it seems in the digital format there is a, a great desire to keep everything. Um, okay. So we are currently exploring two different communities to develop the prototype tools. Um, and we're trying to connect these communities to formal infrastructures of support. So these two organizations could really not be uh, much different. <laughs> the Bethel AME uh, church community was part of the Underground Railroad. Uh, helped us, uh, the first meeting of the NAACP in Indiana was held at that church. They created the first black school for children, um, and their uh, community is, is dying. Uh, it's going the way of the passenger pigeon. Um, the, um, they're older. <laughs> um, I think the youngest member is the pastor, who's 67. Uh, their uh, story is one that happens to many black communities. Uh, um, the university came in through urban renewal, the highway system, and completely displaced them. So they became very uh, geographically isolated. And now they're old and uh, lacking funds. But they have this amazing rich archive dating back to 1836. Um, and it was by happenstance that I got connected with this church, which, oddly enough, is right across the street from my office. It was just 
pure coincidence that I learned of them and the riches that they had. Now the cyclists are very different. They are uh, new and hip and young and really getting a lot of cash from the city and the taxpayers and from uh, nonprofits. So, um, and they're getting larger every day. Um, but both of these groups have, uh, um, have uh, their, their outputs are in danger of not being preserved and being lost. Um, these guys, 99% paper. These guys, 99% digital. Okay. So um, for both of these groups, uh, social media platforms and the creation of tools that extend the functionality of those platforms are important components of preserving their cultural representation. So we wrote a letter uh, to, in the form of a proposal to the National Archives, and we got great initial reviews. Uh, they thought we were uh, on the right track. And um, in this proposal, we wanted to create uh, a digital representation of this rich archive so that the community can continue to have access to its archive once it moves to the historical society. Right, because anybody who's ever used an archive who's used an archive. OK, you go in, you lose your bag, you get a pencil. And this is very different than going into the pastor's office and pulling out some letters from 1850s. So we wanted to have that connection to the community. And we also wanted to create community engagement tools to capture the cultural narrative that goes along with all the rich documentary evidence. Um, so next slide, yeah. So unfortunately, we didn't get the money. Um, one of the reviewers is like the real value is the tools, not the community. And the community is your problem. Um, and in our final letter from the head archivist, the, he, he basically literally said, um, this community is dying. Take these documents to the historical society and drop them off. Okay. So he wanted to completely <laughs> disengage the community from the archives and uh, from the process. So um, community archives, I don't, any Traditional archives really haven't cared that much about use. They care about preservation. Community archives are the opposite. Um, and often they are focused on use because they would like to achieve social justice for their group. So while bikers are not historically an underrepresented group, they are a physically vulnerable group. Um, currently, much of their content is um, that would comprise a community archive is scattered throughout numerous uh, social media platforms. We would like to seek, uh, we seek to develop a um, dynamic, born digital, geospatial archive to document, analyze, and preserve the history of cycling in Indiana. Um, but we would also like to create some tools for this archive. So, for example, um, we were dinged because our, a lot of our bikers have been killed or hit by cars, and so this is a bad thing. So with the community archive, again, emphasis on use, we could um, geocode accidents uh, with user experience around those accidents. So um, these are these images all document cycling in Indiana. So this is a tweed ride, which uh, is uh, the counter to all the sweaty spandex clad middle-aged men zipping around the city. Um, this is, we have a night ride, 20 miles, starting at midnight. Um, these are people uh, on, in the news complaining about cyclists and how much they hate them. And this fellow, uh, very sad story, he um, was, uh, started to ride his bike to work to lose weight. And he was like mid-20s, and one day, a school bus driver decided not to stop at a red light and ran right over him and killed him. So his, his blog is out there. And uh, the last line of it is, please slow down because I'm out there on my bike. And you can look it up, it's quite sad. So we could go grab all these things. We could go grab this content, but we really don't have the rights to it, right? And so uh, we've discussed ways in which we could possibly achieve those rights, and that would be possibly creating a registry where people would say, hey, you can go grab my content. Um, or we could, in fact, work right with the social media platforms, because in their terms of service, they're allowed to uh, basically extend their privilege of free and permanent license to anyone they want. So now it will give you. You want to sit there, or do you want to? Well, I, if, if that's all right, I'll, okay. just, I'll just stay that's here good. and do this. So as we as we thought about the formation of, of the center that we that we want to to, to build, 
uh, we started formulating, okay, what, what would it look like if we were able to, um, to leverage the network of local library branches that already exist and then create programs and tools that would allow the users of those libraries to go out and document the history. So we've got one or two you know, specific projects that we kind of started with and then we started thinking about, okay, how could we generalize this to uh, maybe a much larger effort? So I created this uh, crazy looking document here that you probably can't read the, the, the text on, uh, but I'm gonna take you through it and, and hopefully when we come back to it at the end, it'll make a little, little bit more sense. So the core idea is that we want to use those local library branches and their patrons to go out and document the history of the community, you know, in real time as it's happening. Now, that doesn't mean we wouldn't want to take the history that, you know, people bring in in their cardboard box with the old photos, et cetera. We would do that too. But we're really very interested in uh, the born digital content, okay? So we came up with an idea for creating programs that we would, we would send to this network of library branches. So um, we wanted to organize those programs around a topic, a theme, or an issue that would be interesting to hopefully general communities, uh, although we might, we might uh, be able to, to get more specific cases uh, on the local level. So I'll get back to that in just a minute. But the program would document either the community or community organizations, or possibly community issues. And we would set this program up first with a, with a web home. So when the program starts, we've got a website there that helps people understand what it is, what it's about, maybe gets them started, that sort of thing. Uh, we would create social media accounts because if we create the accounts, we now have the rights to go in and, and you know, harvest the content uh, from those accounts. Uh, and we think we would build a mobile app. And the mobile app would among other things, allow people just to simply upload that content directly to the project as opposed to going through the, uh, the social media step. But uh, either way, it should, it should work in a similar manner. Uh, and then the libraries would promote these programs through local media uh, and maybe through special activities that would maybe engage people to come in and participate. So the libraries participating in the, in the programs would actually receive the uploaded content and they would keep it. They would store it on a server that they would, they would have and maintain. So in, in that way we get kind of this distributed network uh, at the very beginning. Uh, then the content, the content would be indexed and cataloged. Uh, each library would keep their own archive and then they would forward that to a central repository that the Chime project would, would, would keep. Now, the libraries would then curate displays and exhibits and other kinds of online content out of the material that comes into their program and then share that with their users. Uh, and then the central project, the Chime project, would aggregate the program content and, and curate exhibits of all of the, the content. And I didn't define what Chime was, did I? I jumped right into this. We like our acronym. It's community history and motion every day. So the mobile piece of this is, is very important to us. Um, now, we would need to develop some tools and resources for the libraries to make this work. Uh, one of those important tools would be templates and guidelines for setting up those websites. So we wouldn't want to have to burden the library with, oh, there's a new program coming out, we have to build a website for it. We would create kind of the, the template, they just simply insert their particulars and that sort of thing to, to get that uh, website up quickly. Also guidelines for what the social media sites and, and uh, uh, other kinds of assets of that type would need to be. We would create a mobile app and the app would be capable of capturing photos, video, audio and also geolocation data uh, for things that get directly uploaded. And then we'd need some tools for, for taking the content from the Facebook and the Twitter accounts, etc. And, and, and create an automated method for taking that content and indexing it and, and uh, archiving that. Uh, we figured that there probably would need to be some training for uh, server setup and the, the, the infrastructure that might go along with it. And then also templates for designing online exhibits from the content that we get back at the end, make that uh, process uh, a little easier. So what would a Chime program look like? Um, so we, we looked at the, the, uh, the bicycle program, we looked at uh, the program for the Bethel Church, and then uh, Andrew was approached the other day 
with uh, uh, a county that has a, a county fair, and the, and the light bulb kind of went off in my head. It's like, oh, that would be the perfect example because uh, let's say that you decided that you were going to document your county fair. Well, if you had a lot of participants, you might be sending, you know, uh, a couple of dozen, maybe maybe even a hundred people out to the fair, and they're each recording their own perspectives of what the county fair is about. So you've got the kids on the midway, you've got the people eating the fair food, you've got, uh, you know, the people in the animal barns, and, and you know, just all kinds of things are going on there. And now, hopefully, we get all of that back, and that provides somebody a way to, to, uh, to create a really beautiful um, uh, uh, exhibit out of that. Here's what happened at the fair this year. If you do that for enough years, you begin to develop, you know, a really nice resource that shows you trends. How do things change over time? You know, how did, how did this uh, happen over the last 10 years, say? So, we think that the program ought to invite everybody in the community, from the youngest to the oldest who want to participate, and, and it should have little special uh, uh, activities possibly to engage uh, the school children or anybody else who's interested. Uh, we think that at least the programs coming from the central organization ought to have fairly universal community heritage themes or maybe focus on you know pretty uh, generalized community issues and goals. Um, but uh, we, we would like to be able to take in content that went from the old pictures to you know the latest <laughs> stuff that's coming out now. We don't want to just focus it on the mobile piece. Uh, but we think that that's the direction things are going, and that makes it easy for us to do this. But the programs might be seasonal and event-based. Uh, they might uh, involve community documentation. You've got the genealogists who are documenting the cemeteries or the people documenting old neighborhoods or landmarks, for example. Uh, community organizations, uh, the, the, the Bethel Church that uh, Andrea was talking about is a perfect example of that. Uh, all communities have, have those kinds of organizations that have histories that are both going backward and forward. And then community issues, social issues, political issues, awareness issues, maybe even a fundraiser. You know, you, you could uh, get the word out and, and get people's support uh, behind something that the community wanted to do. Now, Chime is mobile. So, um, you know, while we want any kind of content, the mobile devices are really great at documenting what, where, and when. So, um, you know, if we can integrate projects with the social media or design an app that is like social media where it's very simple for people to upload pictures and videos, then it's very much more likely that they will do it. Um, the mobile app would keep the programs handy. It could, uh, although we might only have one app, it could be aware of what the current programs are so that it's easy to choose which one you want to uh, participate in uh, and, uh, and just go. But uh, the mobile app could document the locations of landmarks and building sites. Uh, we could document the locations of events or distances. Uh, it will be very useful for mapping uh, historical sites. And uh, one, one thing that is a little bit different that I think we could create, a new kind of content, would be a guided tour. You could actually have someone take you through that old neighborhood or, or uh, take you through that cemetery or possibly, you know, find all the best restaurants in town or, you know, whatever they were interested in, uh, a guided tour would allow someone to relay that information with audio annotation or, or, or possibly text annotation uh, and then someone else could actually come and build on that. So it would be kind of a growing document if you chose to, to do that. All right. So, where do the programs come from? Uh, our original vision was that, well, okay, the, the main organization will just kind of come up with these programs and, and disseminate them out to the libraries. But there's really no reason why the libraries themselves couldn't uh, originate programs, especially programs that were uh, designed for their community, and they could also share them across the network if they chose to. Uh, users and community organizations could certainly uh, create their own programs, uh, especially if they're documenting their own history, then they should be able to make that happen. But one thing that we think would be particularly interesting would be partnering the national organizations that might want to leverage the kind of network that could be created through the libraries. And, um, you know, you may have uh, something that's done in, con in conjunction with a larger organization, maybe a nonprofit, maybe even a sponsor who could provide some of the funding to make it work and, uh, uh, and get some, some interesting things to happen 
uh, on both a grassroots level and on a larger scale as well at the same time. So I wanted to kind of take you through the timeline of what this kind of project might look like. Uh, so we're going to go back to the county fair. Um, the first thing that would happen is that there would be an announcement that here's the project that's coming up. All right, so that goes out to the libraries. The libraries then make their own announcement, hey, we're going to document the county fair this year. And uh, they put out their promotions in the local media, raise the awareness, and get people interested. Um, when the project starts, which would be, uh, you know, at, at this point in time here, uh, the project website would be launched, we would have the social media accounts set up, and then uh, the, the mobile app would become aware of the project and people could sign in and, and join up. And that would, that would open a window of time where people could submit uploads to the project, whatever their content might be. And, and also during that time, hopefully as these things are coming into the library, the process of indexing and cataloging and creating metadata around that content is going on. Now, in, in this example, we have uh, the, the window closes. You know, the fair doesn't last all year. It's just going to be for a week or two. Uh, so at that point, you know, the project is done. We have a digital archive. Now, there could be projects that would not be, you know, finite in duration. They might just extend on for as long as we chose to, to let them go. Uh, but in this case, uh, we have kind of a package at the end of the time. Uh, and, and that's the point at which we can start the curation project. The people go through the material and they say, okay, here's the best of. Uh, they share that project with the central CHIME repository and um, the, uh, the, the local library creates and opens their own exhibit, okay? Uh, and then at some point the, the, the larger central repository might do that as well. But once we're done with the exhibit, the project is done, archived, and it's in the book. So, so that's kind of the timeline of, of how this would work. So I'm hoping that uh, by taking you through that, this crazy diagram will make a little bit more sense. Here's our network of libraries and users and platforms that we're going to use to, to bring the, uh, the documentation uh, content into the project. This would represent the program creation piece all the pieces that we need to put in place to make it work. And then at the bottom here would be a schematic that shows, okay, how we would create the metadata, do the, uh, um, uh, the archiving and the database system. And in, in this drawing, this would show this as more of a centralized repository. But in truth, we would hope that this would be a network of repositories that were distributed at among the various libraries. That, that adds redundancy and, and it uh, uh, involves everybody giving them control of their own material. So, this is our dream. Now we need some money. <laughs> but we're hoping as we, as we take on smaller projects uh, as they come along and, and do have funding that we can uh, start to build the various pieces that we might need for that project that can benefit us with the roadmap that we have here uh, as things go forward. And then when the opportunity comes, uh, maybe there's some pilot funds or something to, to try this and build it. So that's that's where we have to go. Thank All you. right. Any questions? Any questions for our speakers? Uh, have you thought to, to record the, the previous, the history parts, which you saw, I mean, the, 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 like the oral recordings with the, with the people which can say something? or? I think that would be fantastic. I think that would be fantastic. And that's, that's one of the reasons why, uh, you know, if, if we can build this app, it's really important that it have an audio recording uh, option there because, you know, those kinds of interviews with people like that are, are one of the most uh, engaging ways to, to really, you know, get into the history, in my opinion. Well, in the Omeka platform, you can add uh, audio annotation. Okay, yeah. 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 Which I think would have worked well with the elderly population. I remember in the past involved with the Czech radio, the broadcasting, so the public broadcasting service uh, around with some other non-profit organization, the Memorial of the Nation project. Right. It was really targeted to this. Yeah, you know. we, we have a great one uh, here called uh, StoryCorps that uh, it's just amazing the kinds of things that they yeah. come up with. And that would be, that would be a, a, a great piece to, to add in with this. Yeah. All right. So we need to, for the sake of time, let's um, uh, switch speakers. All right. Thank you very much.